Folks, I was lucky enough to be invited to be a fly on the wall for a small group of mastermind folks who were thinking about investing through a recession. They had a long list of questions that I believe went for over an hour. I thought it was important to talk about that discussion and share with you because, again, I think we might be going through a recession. Hey, yeah, so nothing crazy formal, Michael, but, mm -hmm. you know, there's six of us in this room, uh, all of us who have varying levels of experience. Okay. And we got together in uh, Orange County this weekend, and mm -hmm. we were just, you know, this is, I guess this is kind of like the, not the typical mastermind where we just wanted to share best practices that we've faced during the couple years that we've been investing. And yeah. we were thinking of people who have, you know, more experienced than us that aren't really gurus or, or you know, don't market themselves to be gurus, but have lived through like a recession and a dip and not just have been investing a couple years and, you know, um, had success these past few years when everything was on the up. Yeah. So um, yeah. I'm thinking it'll be helpful if you can give the guys just a little bit of background about yourself and then maybe yep. we can dive into like a Q&A that work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Works for me. Uh, first and foremost, thanks for thinking of me. Um, I thoroughly enjoy helping people. Uh, sort of, Bo, like you said in your intro, there's not a lot of people that have been doing this 20 plus years. Started pre-recession, right? Our first acquisition was in very late 2002, like December 12th or something of 2002, a, a rental home in Fresno, California. Uh, right, re, re Road the wave up. Fresno is a, is a is a location or a city, county, whatever you want to call it. Had tremendous growth 2002 through 2007. It was actually the number one MLS or metro area two years in a row for appreciation. So it was it was nutty to say the least. Uh, we got to a point there in 2007 where we were trying to buy another house. Um, why houses? Frankly, I didn't know any better. It's all I ever knew. It's all I ever lived in. Uh, I incorrectly assumed apartments were, you know, where the million and billionaires played and I never felt like I belonged there. Uh, then went to a meetup, nice gentleman kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, kid, get over yourself. Um, we started looking at small multis. We did a bunch of 1031 exchanges where we went from eight doors to 80, uh, which proved to be great timing because the real estate market crashed. We survived and frankly thrived during the crash, even though lending stopped, right? Banks stopped lending to us. So I've, I've not only invested through a, a rising and falling real estate market, I've invested through a rising and falling uh, lending market, which is probably more complex to, to navigate. And um, then of course we rode the wave out. We replaced two six figure incomes. My wife, Olivia left the workforce, I think in 15, uh, I left in 18 and uh, have spent our last couple of years uh, helping people. So that's kind of my story. I'm an open book. I answer all questions. I don't promise you'll like the answers, but I promise to answer them. And of course, they're always just my opinions. I'm not a guru. I don't claim to be. I don't do any one-on-one -on -one coaching because I don't want that responsibility, but I'm always ha happy to answer questions. And of course, I wrote the book One Rental at a Time to document that 15-year journey I went through in a couple of minutes. So that's, that's who I am, Bo, and happy to answer other questions. Yeah. So why don't I just kick things off? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you, you mentioned the lending kind of was difficult and navigating through that. Mm -hmm. So kind of walk us through what that looked like. Did it stop completely or mm -hmm. was it just a lot more hurdles to get your loan approved? Like what? Did no, that it, it stopped um, entirely. I mean, I remember. So again, so let's just set the stage, right? So this is probably 2009, um, we were, we were still doing deals. We were doing, we were buying something about every six months, um, into the peak, out of the peak, right? We did, we never knew, we didn't know where this was going. You know, I'd be lying if I said I saw the crash coming cause I didn't, all I knew is I couldn't buy another house in cash flow. That's, that's the extent of my knowledge, but I was going to a bank to get a loan. Uh, my wife and I are, we're in a very lucky position. We had both of us individually had credit scores over 800. We both had W-2s of over six figures. Uh, we both had net worths individually and collectively of over a million dollars. 
and we never assumed that we would have a problem getting a conservative financed bank loan, right? We're talking 30, 25 or 30% down. We're like, ah, no problem. Uh, we walked into Bank of America and they basically told us to F off, which we, we took as an insult. Uh, then we went to Wells Fargo and they essentially told us the same thing. We pressed them like, what are you guys talking about? We're like your ideal borrowers. We've never missed a payment on anything anywhere. And you know, we have savings and all these things. And they said, no, you're a real estate investor. You are the reason we are in this problem. Um, all of you real estate investors who have multiple properties are going bankrupt. We don't want to extend ourselves. We will not lend to real estate investors, just point blank. That was a shock to our system. And again, you have to remember, prices are falling every week. So we were hamstrung, right? We, we didn't know what to do. Um, we're like, oh my God, are we going to have to pay cash for everything? What the, that's going to really stunt our growth. Um, but it was, it was shocking to see how lending could change. Uh, and and um, yeah, you got to watch lending. lending. Lending lending can change overnight. Okay. You know, one of, one of the things that, you know, a lot of us are not concerned about, but keeping a watchful eye on is what you just mentioned. We don't really know when the tides have changed until the tides have changed mm -hmm. almost. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't know what we don't know. So as we try to insulate ourselves from the downturn that, is coming. Mm -hmm. uh, we're kind of looking at our business practices. We're looking at our underwriting, revisiting the leverage and the risk across our portfolio. Mm -hmm. um, I know you have some one to four units along mm -hmm. with some smaller multifamily units. Mm -hmm. Looking back, um, what would you have gone one way or the other or continue to do like both uh, in terms uh, of adding that in your portfolio? See, that's, that's probably one of the biggest areas I disagree with all these silly gurus and social media people pushing one way or the other. Uh, I believe in quite simply buying whatever produces the, mo the highest yield. Uh, you know, some people call that cash on cash. I don't freaking care what it is. I'm, I am able to compare a 512 square foot house, one bedroom, one bath built in the 1940s against a 20 unit apartment building. And I say those specifically because I only talk about what I've done. That's, that's, that's all, you know, that's kind of the range we've done and I'm going to buy whatever produces the highest return in some market. That's the 512 square feet single family home in other markets. That's a 20 unit apartment building. And I don't, I add, I add whatever's better at the time. And, and, and in today's market, as we sit and talk in the middle of February, 2020, in most markets, that's single family homes. And oh, by the way, if you can get single family homes with 30 year fixed rate debt on it, I, you know, I frankly think you're stealing uh, because fixed rates won't be this low for forever. So um, I wouldn't touch a multifamily uh, in this market, especially a value add multifamily, unless you can find a unicorn with a four leaf clover standing next to a pot of gold. If you find one of those outlier deals, go for it. Uh, but it's really got to be that kind of extra special deal. Um, just because you want to say you own a hundred or a thousand units, you're, you're an idiot. It's about cash flow. It's about how hard your money is working and throw your ego out the window and, and just pick the best deal. <clears throat> Hi, Michael, uh, Dan Perez. Hi. Uh, I've, so I've been in real estate investing for about a year now. Um, mm -hmm. and I'd like to hear your thoughts. I know you were saying that you've made it through the recession. Uh, mm -hmm. you came out just fine. So congratulations mm -hmm. on that. Uh, anything that you can share with some of us that are starting out to maybe uh, be weary of as you're going in to get these uh, maybe long-term debt products on our portfolios? I just went through one uh, mm -hmm. portfolio refi um, on a couple properties, getting ready to do another. Any any products we should be hesitant to dive into or any products we should maybe <laughs> lean towards as well? Yeah, I so the ones that caught people last time was – really short-term stuff. I call them the two and 28s. Uh, it's a product that doesn't exist today, but it, that doesn't mean it won't come around again. Basically what happened is countrywide at the time in IndyMac, both companies went out of business. They were giving what I call teaser loans, right? 1%. I even remember 0.9% for two years. <coughs> and then it would, it would reset to like 9% at, at, after two years. And the story was, don't worry about it. You'll just refi because real estate goes up forever. 
right? So banks were trying to create loan products that could keep housing going up. So anything that has artificially low interest rates up front mm -hmm. and a term less than, frankly, less than five years makes me nervous. Um, I, would, and I would never get that loan product if for some reason I had to get that loan product, I would do all my calculations on the fully indexed value, not the teaser value, because you always have to think about the worst case scenario. Uh, people who only think about, you know, trees growing to the heavens <clears throat> haven't lived through a recession. And I've invested through at least two big ones. And you've got it. I always think about the downside. What's the downside? And if I can survive the downside, I let the upside take care of itself. And that's worked out for us for 20 years. Thank you. Yeah. And just so I'm clear, when you say a portfolio loan, are you talking about multiple assets inside a single loan or are you just talking about a refi of a single family home? Uh, so we refinanced uh, 13 single family homes. Into a single loan? Correct. Okay. What did you, so we're talking like 6% interest, something like that? Uh, so we got 5.125%. Fixed um, for how long? So it's a 20 year AM and it's okay. a five year uh, it adjusts after five years. Yeah. yeah, that's that's okay. Yeah, twenty year and that's kind of heavy. All right, because but you know, good news is you're paying off a bunch of principal every year, so that's not bad. Yep. Um, yeah, I I'd, I'd do that loan. That that's been one thing that we've actually been discussing as this group here, and it's kind of the the final piece of the puzzle that my wife and I are working on is that long term debt piece. Bo's brought up some good um, mm -hmm. products that uh, Corvest offers and everyone comes with this pros and cons either higher fees up front but you might get that 30 year am or yeah so so let's talk about it let's play with those numbers from my perspective so do you have any 30 year fixed rate debt any i do not well you need to go get some okay so so what i would be thinking about is which of these assets um do i think i'll keep forever right do you have some high quality stuff or location stuff or whatever it is for you I would go get some 30 year, I would go get as much 30 year fixed rate debt on assets I plan to keep more than five years today. Uh, even if you had to pay more fees, okay. because I think the rates in five years are going to be higher, which is going to make the refi more expensive. Even though your debt debt uh, might be lower, I think if you refi into a higher interest rate environment, your payments could be the same, right? Which is not what you're going to be expecting. So I would take advantage and get as much 30 year debt. Frankly, everybody who's watching this, you need to go get as much 30 year fixed rate debt under 5% as you can, because I think you'll be, you'll be in a better position, but realize I'm not talking about getting 30 year debt on Burr projects, right? If you're going to be in and out in a year or two, I mean, that's, that's just silly, right? So obviously take this with a grain of salt. Um, what's your intention with the 13? Are, are these kind of like legacy things you're going to pay off and give to your kids or are these, what, what, what do these assets look like? That, that's the goal. Uh, to okay. To, to hold them for a while. Um, what's nice about this credit union that we worked with is uh, we can sell off single properties um, uh -huh. and there's no penalty uh, mm -hmm. whatsoever. So mm -hmm. that was one thing that we liked, uh, just having that flexibility because you always go in with one thing in mind, but maybe yeah. a property or two that's a problem child and we're allowed to get out of that. So, yeah. um, but for yeah. us, I think one question I'd have for you is, yeah. putting that 30 year debt uh, on your properties, are you putting this in your personal name? How are you getting these, uh, Products. Well, I, again, you got to watch the lending environment. Back when I started, it was really easy to get loans in an LLC. Today, it's hard. Um, you know, to answer really what you're asking is yes, I have a couple of single family homes in my name because it gave me a much better um, um, loan product, right? That's just the environment we're in today. It won't always be that way. I suspect in two or three years, they'll be fine with LLCs again. Um, you just got to watch that. And, um, you know, obviously put a monster umbrella policy on top, run a good business you know, do all the right things, insulate yourself. Uh, but yes, I have a few single family home loans because you can only get a few uh, in my personal name uh, for that reason. Do you have any strong lenders that you might be able to recommend uh, to us um, to look into this 30 year? Do you have a W-2? Yes, I do. Yeah, so I, would, I wouldn't overthink it. I would go to the bank where you get do all of your banking, right? Who has your checking and savings and say, hey, I want to get an investment loan. Um, it'll be my you know, first one or whatever. And they should, four should be really easy. Four should be easy. I mean, like uh, balance sheet, paycheck stub, credit or, or checking and savings account. It shouldn't be hard. Um, so don't overthink the first four. Okay. Any questions? I, I do. Um, so this is Bo again. <laughs> hey, Michael. Hi, Bo. 
Um, so another hot topic on the top of our minds as we scale our rental portfolio, as we go from like a dozen to two, three, mm-hmm. um, what we're looking at is the highest and best use of our time mm. and making sure that we outsource you know, the things that we can, automate the things that we can and create systems and processes. And as we kind of look at our portfolio, uh, we're trying to identify what those are. Um, I personally am kind of a control freak. So (laughs) whether it be managing the project managers on my rehabs Mm -hmm. or the bookkeeping, I I do it myself. And, Mm -hmm. you know, this, this might be, you know, silly, but because I'm an accountant, I feel like I can catch the errors a little bit better. So I don't outsource it right now, but Mm -hmm. I can also see if this turns into like a hundred plus units, it's definitely not scalable and I'm not using my time efficiently. Mm -hmm. So what are things that you have incorporated? What systems and processes you've incorporated in your business and what do you outsource it? Yeah. So this is something I had to ask myself very early on. And again, you know, Bo, you know this, the others may not. So when we go back to the very beginning, I was a, I was in the tech industry. Um, I worked 60 to 70 hours a week and then traveled on top of that for my job. I was in four cities a week for most of my working career. So I was all over this place and, and this was international travel. So I was all fucked up on time zones and stuff. Um, so I had to answer this question very early on. I, I found that there was kind of three areas that I would never outsource, which meant everything else got outsourced. The first one is I would never rely on anybody else to tell me they found a deal. I don't, I don't trust other people. It's my money. I work hard for it. I'm not going to just trust somebody out there that says they found a deal. So the number one thing I had to do was find deals. And that's what I, I looked at my market every day for 10 years in a row because it was my job to find deals for my family to help have us be in a better situation. So that's number one, I would never outsource and have not outsourced even today. Number two, something I was in a unique position to do and own and control was securing capital. Um, that would either be earning a higher income, getting, you know, figure out what in my portfolio I want to do a cash out refi for, what are we going to 1031? It was my job to figure out the highest and best use of our capital. Um, and then when the downturn happened, like the banks turned off, my job was to go court private money, right? I live in the Silicon Valley. I have lots of friends who had high incomes who were very, very scared. <clears throat> so I could work with people I had known 10, 15, 20 years and say, hey, instead of earning 1%, I'll pay you 10, right? So we were able to borrow over a million dollars from private investors and keep growing and growing aggressively, right? So securing capital. And then the last one, Bo, to your point, I still do bookkeeping myself, um, uh, my wife and I are both, uh, from the finance side of the house. Uh, I am an accountant. At least I was out of school before I became a sales guy. So I get numbers very well. Um, the only thing I don't do is actually my tax return. I pay an attor- uh, a CPA slash attorney. Uh, he is both. Uh, so I have de-risked that part of the equation. Uh, but I still do monthly bookkeeping. Uh, my wife still audits it probably every other month now. Um, because again, nobody's going to watch your money like you. Uh, so outside of that, I've had a property manager since day one. I defined the box for what I consider a qualified tenant because I could control that. And then they just, you know, the first person that fits the box is a yes answer. We set up, um, you know, anything below $200, don't bother me. Um, you know, just do it. Uh, I now get pictures of before and after for everything over $200. Um, you know, again, just, just checks and balances. Uh, you know, we have nearly 200 units now and we are probably spending five hours a week kind of reviewing everything and answering questions and deciding on who goes to eviction because we're still active, right? And we're still growing. Um, but I think that answers your question. If not, ask it again. Yeah, no, that definitely <laughs> does. And that's a good segue into my next question. So you have 200 units now. And I know uh, from reading your book, you, you kind of take a look at your portfolio and you, lack of a better word, you prune some of the bad ones, right? Mm-hmm. Um, on the return on equity on some of these. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I want to make sure I'm doing right is making sure I'm not too over leveraged. Mm-hmm. Um, I know Burr is like a hot word you know, <laughs> through the media, bigger pockets and all these uh, other websites. Yeah. So in my underwriting, what I personally do is make sure that there's enough 
cash net cash flow at the end of the day. Sure. And I'm not, you know, stripping out all the equity just for the sake of getting my money back. Mm-hmm. But across your portfolio, what does your leverage look like? And what do you try to maintain in, some, in terms of a percentage wise that you're scaling? Well, uh, so I'm going to answer that question, not as of today, because my answer to today would it's not relevant to your situation. When I was growing, right, when my job, when I was in the phase one of my growth, uh, I wanted to be around, it worked out to be about 70 to 75% LTV, uh, which would still give me cash flow. Bo, you know, in my book, I write about the first mistake I made with a cash out refi, which would have been called Burr back in the day. Uh, I took too much cash and turned a positive property negative, which was painful every month. Um, so, you know, I took, took the lesson learned from there. Banks will over leverage you, right? They're not as conservative as you want them to be. Um, so I, I'm about, yeah, I think, think 75% because again, I needed the cash so I could keep growing. And the key to phase two is re-leveraging cash, either via cash out refis or 1031 exchanges. So um, we very actively, uh, we were managing our portfolio, uh, which is one of the reasons we were able to leave the rat race is because we did that, right? We, we took, we took assets that had, you know, runs and a lot of equity and we reused that equity uh, into bigger things. So, um, you know, the 1031 is very, very powerful. Gotcha. And um, going back to my first question about the pruning, mm-hmm. what kind of metrics or uh, numbers are you looking at when you go to decide, hey, I think this one is just better off selling. It's not worth the headache or whatnot. Yeah, so I think um, I think you're using the word pruning at least differently than I thought about it. I don't, I didn't, I don't really prune, right? I don't look at my portfolio and say which is the bad ones, mm-hmm. right? If there was a bad one, I would of course sell it or, or manage it, it, it differently and, and turn it around. But I didn't look at my portfolio and take the bottom ten percent and sell them. I actually did the kind of the exact reverse. I said what is hot in today's market? What are all the newbie investors chasing and frankly overpaying for and not respecting how hard it is to manage? And I will sell my stuff that matches that because you're giving me a huge equity spread that I don't deserve. So basically when all the newbies want to chase single family homes like in 08, I mean, just, I mean, guys, this will blow your mind since you're in the game, right? So I'm going to, you can look it up, right? You got a computer right there. Look up 1818 Norris Drive East 93703. So look that up on Zillow for me. Tell me when you have it so we can talk about the numbers, please. And by the way, I don't know your name or else I would have said your name. (laughs) I'm sorry, could you repeat the address, please? 1818 Norris, (laughs) N-O-R-R-I-S Drive East 93703. You got it? Pull it up. All right. So go to the, what do they really call it? The sale history or something? Okay. All right. You should see a sale of 107 back in like 02 or 03. Do you see that? Yep. Yep. Okay. So let's talk about this property. That's the first property we ever bought. So we bought it for 107 as it shows there. The yep. market got so nutty. We sold it for what? 260? 264. 264, like, like what, four years later, five years later? Three, three, three years, years. Three years later. Right? Here's the rub. Rent was the same. It was 1100 Oh, wow. So when you idiots want to overpay for my stuff, I will gladly sell it to you. <laughs> the person who bought it lost it, and it retraded at 75 Do you see that? Yep. Right? How long did it take? Four years. Right? Retraded at 75 four years later. It just recently retraded in 19, I think, or it might have been 18. At like one, what? Uh, 17. 17. Oh, 17. Okay. For how much? 153. Sorry, 153. I think it just retraded again at like 178 or something. But, anyways. So, again, the whole story of this is what year did I sell it for 264? 2005. So, 15 years later, it is not even close. Yeah. To the amount I sold it for. So when all the new investors want to run around and chase hot product, I will sell it because you all gave me a hundred thousand dollars in equity 15 years early, probably 20 years early. So I took it. 
That's happening today on an even bigger scale in small multifamily. Every new investor is chasing small multifamily and overpaying even worse. Except today, it's not leveraged debt. It's this equity raises and syndication nonsense that people are doing. So I'm selling that product. If you want to overpay to the tune of 20, 30K a door, I'll let you. And I'll just move the equity in the houses. Michael, so, so with, with your view um, on multifamily, because that, that was one thing that we were discussing today. Um, I haven't yet to get into um, multifamily, but it's mm -hmm. a goal of my wife and I's. Uh, but why? Hold on. Why? Why? Because Grant Cardone says it's cool. I mean, why? Exactly. why? <laughs> exactly. No. Uh, uh, no. For us, I think it's also um, the added knowledge that we're we're gaining, and it's an extra tool we're adding to our tool belt. Uh, I okay. feel as though single family. I don't want to sound bad, but it's fairly easy. It's kind of just the same process. Just you have to apply it to different situations. Like there's different complexities with each deal, mm -hmm. um, and we're just always looking for adding a new, a new tool. Like we spoke about uh, okay. Airbnb this weekend, uh, sure. doing some short term. So it's just one of those things that we would like to do eventually. Um, we haven't sure. had a deal that's, that's worked for us. Um, yeah. But my question to you would be, uh, so are you solely looking at uh, single families right now? Is that? No, again, I look at everything every, all the time. I have one simple spreadsheet. I'm able to compare houses to multifamily and I take the asset that produces the highest yield every time, okay. every time. It doesn't matter. I have one, one spreadsheet that does that. I, I think this whole nonsense of you got to compare multifamily with multifamily and houses with houses is, um, it's what gurus want you to think. They want you to think commercial is different than residential. And I just fundamentally don't believe that it's all my money. And I want to know how hard my money is working and stop trying to confuse me with cap rates and GRMs and all these other things. Um, it's not, it's not different. And Michael, for, for you, and this might be a same question asking, asked a different way, but for that 20 unit, managing that on the bookkeeping and the maintenance request and lease up and all of that versus, let's just say, 20 single family homes or maybe even 12 single family homes, mm. how does it compare uh, over a long period of time? Yeah, so you guys should watch a video I put up. I think it's called 8 to 80 on my, web, on my YouTube channel, but I'll, I'll answer the question. Um, because there's there's three or four slides in there that kind of document the difference between managing eight houses versus 80 apartments. Um, first and foremost, uh, I, I don't know what you guys run your houses at, but my average expense per house was sub 20%, right? Fully burdened expenses. I have never, ever run an apartment for less than 42%. It's just, if you give me, a, if one of these syndicators sends me an email with the 25% expense, expenses on apartments, I, I actually ask them, are you either lying or are you stupid? Because I'm okay either way, <laughs> but which one are you? <laughs> right? It just doesn't work. So, um, what are the yeah, you know, if it's not 40%, I don't even look at the deal. It's just, it's just, it's just, they're just either lying or stupid, one or the other. Um, so I forgot where I was going. Well, oh yeah. Oh, apartments are much harder. What really kills landlords and why I was pressing earlier on that question about why you want to go to multifamily is realize, um, I don't know what your average turn is in a house, but the re one of the reasons it's easy is it's probably five to eight years. I'm guessing, right? That's what it is for me. It's almost eight years. My average turn in apartments is sub two. And what people don't realize is turns are what kill landlords. And oh, by the way, here's the reality of beyond all realities. Apartments look beautiful today because unemployment is three and a half percent. I have invested in apartments when unemployment was at 7%. And let's just say occupancy versus economic occupancy are very, very different. Occupancy means how many heartbeats you have in your units. And they could be full. Economic occupancy is how many heartbeats and checks you as a landlord are getting. And those are very, very different numbers. People who live in apartments in general, there are always exceptions, but in general, live closer to the edge, uh, live closer to paycheck to paycheck. And these apartment, if you're buying multifamily apartments today, you are going to get crushed in the next five years because cap rates are going to go from sub four to six and a half. The values are going to go down. And when you have to refi in your three, five or seven year area, the value is going to be less and you're going to have to go do a capital call with your limited partners. And most of them are going to tell you to F off. 
I see it coming. It's why I will have more cash than I've ever had in two or three years because I will be there buying uh, limited partner positions for pennies on the dollar uh, and maybe even buying uh, more apartment buildings. I am adding houses today aggressively because I wanted 1031 just like I did in our book. Uh, except from going to eight to 80, I'm going to go from 20 to 200. So I need to buy 20 more houses. So I need to buy 30 more houses because houses are better deals. Do the freaking math. I love it. No, that's, that's really good information. I know one thing we were talking about is um, a lot of deals. Everyone says run the numbers. The numbers don't lie. Um, but on paper, a lot of times in, in Indianapolis, it's, it's a pretty big difference between running numbers on a C property versus maybe a B B plus um, as far as the grades go. Uh, and what we're talking about is just because the numbers look great doesn't mean it'll actually turn out that way. <laughs> uh, yeah. we, had, we, we had a very good discussion that, yeah, you might have maybe a one and a half percent rent to cost ratio on yeah. some B properties. Bs might be 1%, maybe a little less, but when you look at how they performed over the past couple of years, oftentimes that 1% on the B property will outperform the one and a half on the C. Um, have you seen that against your port or in your portfolio? every s every single time? And you, what you're not realizing is your one in one and a half today is in the best economy ever. Yeah. You take that and fast forward into a recession. Your your one will go into like a one. Your one will probably go to one point five, but your one point five will go to four. Right? The people that are buying the people that Excel spreadsheet lies. People <laughs> <laughs> freaking lies. You guys are buying asset. You guys. You guys don't know. I know people in these other markets and they're calling me laughing at California investors who are overpaying. You guys are overpaying for this product. It is the best economy ever. And yes, I know the Excel spreadsheet says, you know, double digits. Good luck in five years. You're going to lose these properties or you're going to never be a landlord again because you have tenants that are not paying and then they get out and they damage your property. And there's a re, there's a re, Excel lies, Excel lies. Hey Michael, this is Ernesto. Um, where where are you sourcing your deals from today? Meaning, where am I finding product to buy? Yes. So I'll answer that two ways. So again, when I was building my portfolio, I had a full time job. I bought ninety nine percent of my deals out of what was called the multiple listing service. Think Realtor dot com or Zillow. I retired. I became financially free buying deals out of the MLS which people think is crazy. But if you know your numbers and realize that 99% of the stuff that's listed is trash, you just got to find the 1%. That's why I looked every day for 10 years. It was my number one job, like I told you, was to find deals. And I took that very, very seriously. And I wrote lots of offers, right? During different markets, it might've been one in 20 got a counter. In some markets, it was one in 40. It didn't matter. I just kept going. Um, but now, today, to answer the question, I still get about half my deals out of the multiple listing service, but I have a pretty decent reputation. I have wholesalers and, and whatnot going on. So um, I'd say the other half comes that way. Okay. The, uh, the other question that I was going to ask is, uh, I know you, so I'm not sure exactly what your affiliation with it is, but you, you're, you're kind of tied to uh, an a, a office setup called... Uh, the hub in Fresno, right? Mm -hmm. Can you walk through? Yeah. So I own that. It's mine. It's not yeah. an association. It's mine. So it's mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not associated with it. I own that bitch. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's just be clear on that right now. Um, so first off, uh, um, I was actually flipping that building, right? So that was my intention was to flip that building. It's on a street called Van Ness. Uh, it's, in a, it's in the Tower District, just a wonderful area of Fresno. And I'm sitting there going through it going, man, I really like this building. It's got seven or eight offices in it. It's right on the, it's on the street. It's right near Fresno City College. It's got parking in the back. It's beautifully remodeled. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to add some extra salt and pepper to this and, and keep this thing, meaning I want to even make it nicer. Because what I wanted to do was I wanted to solve a problem, right? I've been investing in Fresno for nearly 20 years, but I don't live there right? Anytime I go to Fresno, it's at least a five hour day, just driving time. But I have so many, I am so intent on helping people, hence this video, um, that I often go down there just to show some people around. So I'm like, okay, enough of this, right? I'm getting older. I don't want to put all those miles on my car. Um, 
what if I created a building and I staffed it with people I know, respect, and trust? I'm like, oh, okay. So I sent a note out to Facebook going, hey, anybody want to join me in this office if I do it? And I told myself, if I could rent four offices of the eight, I would take it off the market and keep it. Right away, five people came back that said, yes, I'm in. I'm like, shit, I got to do this thing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I ended up taking it off the market uh, and I ended up staffing it. But I wanted to staff it to help people. So to me, that meant I had to get licensed agents in there. I got two. I had to get a licensed general contractor in there. I got one that I use regularly. I wanted to get wholesalers in there because I wanted to get deal flow, right? It's not all about everybody else, but I wanted to get deal flow. I wanted to get a flipper in there and I got the best flipper in Fresno EVC homes there. And I ended up adding an Airbnb guy, right? So I'm like, wow, this is awesome. I got the best and brightest there. They're all people I know, respect, and trust. And uh, now people are going to Fresno and A, I don't have to go, which is awesome. B, people are calling up the hub to do deals, which is awesome. I feel like I'm helping. And I'm getting some deal flow from the wholesalers that are there because we're doing some co-marketing and um, actually I have a mailer. See, did a mailer calling out the building. There's a picture of the building right there and a picture of my book because I'm trying to be different than all the other wholesalers, right? You guys get letters like this, just these BS yellow letters and stuff, right? I want to be different. So I am different. So the hub is mine. Uh, I expect one month, one deal a month from it for myself. And I'm hoping it's helping dozens of people a month because for me, the rest of my life will be about being happy. And, and part of that is helping others. So that's the hub. That's pretty cool. Now, yeah, and like I, I, like I love that. Um, but on the flip side, my concern in attempting to kind of replicate your model is kind of putting your reputation in the reputation of others. Like, what if they mm -hmm. act in everybody is signed up for a way to a, a kind of yeah in the future. Yeah, I've thought about that. So a couple of things. First off, I make it very, very clear. No one works for me. They're all their individual companies. I have no affiliation, no connection. Uh, I never sign a year lease. Everybody goes on month to month right away. So one bad actor gets a warning and the second time they get booted. Um, and again, everybody in there today, I have known for at least five years. Okay. Yeah, four years. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah. So it's, um, it's done with intention. There is certainly that risk, but again, it goes back to everybody's their own company. You know, um, I'm not, the, the thing I didn't want to do is create this umbrella, like where Mike Zuber's at the top and here, you know, Mike Zuber LLC and everybody reports to me and it's all fictitious and nobody knows. No, none of that. Uh, I have no, I get, I get no kickback, no incentives from any deals that are done in the office. I have nothing. So yeah, no financial, other than they pay me rent, uh, they don't get anything from me. So, Michael, this is, uh, this is me here. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk about your hiring and who's on your payroll, who's on your team? Yes, I have zero employees, have never had any employees. I will have never employees, so no hiring for me. <laughs> That's great. Well, we, we had set aside 10 minutes for that question, so. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, so let's just, so, uh, well, I answer a little more seriously. So I, I was a uh, senior leader um, the last decade or so in my career. And the hardest part of that job was managing people. Uh, so I knew when I got to financial independence that the, my number one rule is I don't want employees. Uh, it will probably stunt my growth. It will probably make, you know, people like Grant Cardone and the like will call me soft or an idiot or, or whatever. And uh, I don't care. Um, I am focused on being happy, not on being the biggest. And um, I live a simple life. I still live below our means. We have a couple of nice things. Um, but happiness comes with living below your means, not having a thousand units, not having a private jet, not having 10 employees. Uh, I will never, ever have an employee. Earlier, you talked about uh, the highest yield, right? Mm -hmm. That's your criteria. It is. is. There, would you put a certain number to that? Like what, what, what excites you? Uh, well, you see, that's a great question. I've been doing this so long. You got to know what market you're in. That's why I look every day. I still look every day. I looked this morning before this call. 
Um, in today's market, my, my average deal, right? So I often teach my students. That's the only thing you have to know is what is a bad average, good, or great deal, right? And, and that is all based on yield. An average deal in my market today uh, is about five and a half percent because prices are increasing. So if you can get 6% or above, you're in the good or great category. Back when I started, like 02, it was probably 8%. Uh, during the peak, it was negative, frankly. Um, you know, back at the crash, if it wasn't 15% in 2010 or 11, I wouldn't look at it, right? I mean, it, all, the, all the buyers disappeared and they were literally in the, literally in the multiple listing service. Uh, if it wasn't 15%, I wouldn't look at it. So you got, you got to, there's no hard and fast rule. It changes all the time. Like a year ago, it was 6%. Uh, now it's five and a half because the market's getting hot. All these investors are coming in. And just to be clear, we're talking cap rate or cash on cash? I think most people call it cash on cash, okay. right? For me, it's really simple, right? The denominator is what's the down payment, closing cost, and any make ready. That's the denominator. And the numerator is expected yearly cash flow after make ready is done, right? So rent minus fully burdened expenses. Okay. Right? And that produces a decimal. You times that by 100%, it equals yield. Michael, are you using, uh, and you probably have multiple ways of doing this, but are you using private money to um, take down these deals? And then also, are you rehabbing them? Like what, what's kind of your strategy? Yeah. I use private money. Um, I view private money is an important thing. Um, I don't use it as much as I could. I have, I have access to, to seven figures, but there's just not enough deal flow out there today. Uh, I have a, I have an okay pile of cash that I'd, I'd rather use myself because private money is, you know, it's, it's expensive. Uh, but I did create a private money program specifically. I've done it twice. Uh, and I think you need to realize who your investors are and what, what do they want. So back in 2010, 11, everybody was afraid. So I simply paid 10% interest only. No points, no fees, no nothing, right? Just 10% interest only. And I had more money come to me than I knew what to do with. Uh, today, I, I, did, uh, I did about 2 million bucks in private money the last two years total. I created a program called Six and Twenty because people weren't really afraid, but they wanted to feel like they were part of the action. So what I would do is pay six percent interest uh, on the loan, and then I would give them twenty percent of the profit if I was going to do the flip. Right. Uh, so I create products that match the market and match my investors. Um, I only have one private money loan out today that hopefully will be paid off next week when the deal closes. So I don't do a lot of it, but I have a, I have access to it. If I if I had a bunch of deals come my way, I, I could I could spin that up again pretty quickly. Okay. And on the back end, um, do you ever use? Because I know we were talking earlier about the thirty year um, products, and that's something that's really important to me. Are you having credit partners put this into their name to get these lower rates for fixed thirty, or are you getting fixed thirties in your no. LLC? No, I haven't gotten a fixed thirty in my LLC. Oh. Um, but I, I have so much product. I have so much inventory. It's hard for me individually to get a 30 year fixed loan today. Right. Um, and, and so what type of products are, are you seeing? So like if, if you were to, you're, you said you're closing on one pretty mm -hmm. soon, what's your uh, goal or vision for putting a long-term uh, debt on, on that? So that, that I'm going to pay cash for cause it's a dump. And then I will probably burr out or refi out as you guys would call it uh, probably in four or five months. Uh, I'm going to put a product on it, just a 30 year loan from cash call mortgage who does California loans. Sure. Uh, it'll probably be for me, it'll probably be six and an eighth, maybe 6% okay. 30 year, fully, fully burdened, fully amortized. Wow. Okay. It's fine. Not a great loan. Most, everybody listening to this can get a better rate than I can get. That's, that's the reality that I'm in. Yeah. I think one, one of the better 30 thirties that we found, I kind of called around at five or six banks last week and one of the better rates I got was, uh, I think it was 6.125 with, uh, finance. Six, America. Six, six and eight. Yeah. 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 So that, that was yeah. the best yeah. I've seen so far. Yeah. That's about what I, that's about what I'm getting. Right. I'm, I'm hoping rates are going to tick down a little bit. The 30 year, just the 30 year bond just went under 1.9. So I'm hoping for six, but yeah, I'll take six and eight. Okay. That's fine. One, one major hurdle that we're facing as, um, Burr investors is on that appraisal. Um, that's yeah. the one thing that we cannot control. Um, yeah. and so we're in a Facebook group that has around a thousand, maybe 1500 members. And that's probably one of the biggest concerns people have is they put all this work into it. They did their due diligence, you know, 
got a couple CMAs um, ahead of the deal yeah. from different agents, PMs, um, and then they get to the appraisal and it's nowhere near what they were expecting. Um, yeah. It kind of kills the deal. Um, yeah. Have you had any good or bad experiences with appraisers that maybe? Yeah, I on? mean, so so David Green, right? He wrote the book on Burr, right? Let's just give him full credit. Bigger Pockets guy, Brandon Turner, Josh Dorkin, all those guys have been pushing Burr and people are just chasing it. But what they're not saying is what you just highlighted. A purchase money appraisal versus a refi appraisal have always been different. CMAs are done on purchase money appraisals, right? Because you have a purchase contract. You have two independent buyers who have no affiliation saying, I think it's worth X. And a refi appraisal, which everybody tries to do on a Burr project, is not a two-party transaction. There's no other side. And the bank, given what they went through in 08, has to be extra conservative. And oh, by the way, appraisers have to be extra conservative. And when in doubt, they go down. So refi appraisers, refi appraisals will be 10 to 20% sometimes lower than a purchase money appraisal because you don't have that second party involved. And the fact that that isn't talked about more is a crime. I know lots of people who are doing Burr projects that are getting screwed and having to do 401k loans to pay off hard money because they got CMAs on purchase money. Burr projects are very, very hard because the most important thing to do is the refi. It's getting out. It's not getting in. It's getting out. And people do not talk about this enough. Burr has worked tremendously the last five years because the market has been appreciating. And the fact that there are people making lots of money selling books who are doing it the last five years and not calling out the fact that the market's different, it's flat today and maybe going down in some areas, is a crime. And that's what I think about that. Okay. And I, I think most, if not all of us, are in agreement uh, for that. I mean, it's just it's the number one thing that a lot of these newer investors um, keep reaching out to us saying, hey, I got a low appraisal. Um, one thing that really helped with my appraisal was uh, they take the income-based approach. Um, they, they look at our leases and uh, we were successfully able to, to burr completely um, out, of, out of all 13 doors, which cool. really helped us out. Um, I didn't realize sure. how big of a blessing it was at the time that they also looked at the income-based approach, but it is a concern I have moving forward where you try to put yourself in the best position possible based on the market. But Again, it's the one part yeah. that you can't Yeah, again, you you are in a situation where you created rentals and got out, right? Some people trying to do Burr are selling to owner occupants, right? So, I mean, there's you just got to be careful. It's not as easy as the book makes it sound. Sure, yep. And are, are you focusing on uh, some active uh, income as well with, with the flip? arm of your business? Is that something? Yeah, I mean, it's, the, it's, it's, it's again, it's nothing I retired on. Yeah. Right. I retired at 45. I'm relatively still young. I'm old compared to you guys, but relatively still young. And I needed something to fill up some of my day. So I did start buying the worst properties on the block, um, fixing them up and selling them to new landlords. So I do stick renters in. Um, but again, I'm very conservative. Um, I often pay cash for these. And I know my worst case situation is I just keep them. So, uh, you know, yes, I've, I flipped 42 properties in the last 26 months. Wow. Um, but it's not, um, you know, I don't want to be known as a flipper by any means. I'm, I'm a buy and hold guy. Okay. Any short term, uh, rentals you do? No, no I, I, it's funny. I just bought a product. I just bought a house, two family, one lot would have been a great Airbnb. I bought it thinking it would be an Airbnb. I brought it to the wife cause she was kind of in, uh, if you know anything about our story, one of the key elements is we've been on the same page since day one. Um, she looked at it and she goes, you know what? I don't want an Airbnb, so uh, we're gonna end up we're gonna end up selling it to someone who does. Um, there's too many rules changing, too many things. I think it. I think too many people are going after it, and you know, Airbnb, you know, could. Uh, you, for us, it would always be okay. What's what's the plan B, right? Does it? Am I overpaying because I'm gonna Airbnb this product, or in my worst case scenario, can I turn it into a monthly rental and I'm still cash flow positive? That would be an important distinction for me. Um, if the answer is it only cash flows Airbnb at 20 days plus, it, it's going to be interesting. There are people now, I mean, the hottest topic I see on social media today is let's Airbnb product we don't own, right? I mean, 
yeah, I, I get it. Yeah, you can you can um, sign a lease with a landlord and then go behind his back and sublease it to people on the daily rate. But man, that's going to come back to bite some people. Um, I, anytime you think this real estate game is too easy and you're selling a, a wish and a dream and no ownership, that's disingenuous in my opinion. Any advice for us uh, moving forward? Um, I, I know we we're talking about market corrections, kind of protecting yourself, uh, not putting yourself out there too much. But well, let's talk about market correction because I think we're using that word, but I think you and I think about it differently. Should Will there be a market correction in the stock market over the next five years? Yeah, absolutely. It's going to happen, right? It'll be a bear market at some point. Um, will it happen in multifamily? Absolutely. I'm screaming that every chance I get. Absolutely. People are overplaying. Cap rates sub 4% are just stupid. Will it happen in single family homes? Yes. In some markets like Orange County, Bay Area, Manhattan, it's already happening, right? You already see negative prices. That's because they're unaffordable. In my book, I talk about the affordability index being the number one thing that saved our ass during the crash because we got out when it got low. Um, I think most of America is still very affordable. And I think lending is very strict. So I do not see this big balloon that is going to take down the price of single family homes, at least not in the current environment. Even if, even if unemployment goes from three and a half to seven, we have such low inventory of available homes. I can't see single family homes in most markets being hit. That's why I am adding multifamily, especially since I can go get relatively cheap debt. I don't think Single family homes in 90% of the U.S. will be affected in the last recession and the next recession. Um, I'm not scared of it. And they, yeah, so I, I think my definition of a crash is different than yours. What do you think the future of supply versus demand looks like? Um, you mentioned um, low inventory. Um, we're not building at the pace of keeping up with uh, mm -hmm. population gains. So in, mm -hmm. in, in your opinion, like what does the future look like in terms of potentially working towards a solution or is it just going to continue to get tighter? Uh, well, so I can only answer with what I'm doing, right? So I've been, I watch this all the time. I do daily videos and stuff like this. So Im available inventories in the multiple listing service as a collective of the U S is lowest on record. And the record goes back to 1982. And oh, by the way, we have a hell of a lot more homes than we had in 1982. So saying that we're at the lowest ever is frightening. What that means in a supply demand driven world is two things. First and foremost, prices have to go up, especially in affordable product. It just has to, right? It's just unquestioned. And second, it is, it is um, become behooving builders to build. But what's happening with builders now is there's no talent, no skill. Right, All the construction workers who were building like hotcakes in 08 found other jobs in trucking and manufacturing and things of that nature. So what we're going to have is we have a shortage of construction workers. And we all know that immigration is tight uh, like it's never been before. So you know, the, the, you know, people coming from other countries to help us with our building is harder than it used to be. So building is going to get more expensive, which again means prices have to go up. So the short answer is in the short term, meaning the next two to three years, I fully expect single family housing to go up double digits for most of America. I mean, just look at that 1818 Norris Drive house we had up on the screen earlier, right? It's at whatever it was, 178 today. It could very easily get back to 264 that I sold it at. But then what happens? People like me who bought during the crash, there is a price I will sell my houses at, right? I own, I don't know, pick a number, 40 houses. I won't sell them at 175, but would I sell them at 275? Maybe. Would I sell them at 375? Hell yeah, <laughs> right? So prices are going to go up until inventory comes on or builders come back. It, it's, all I can tell you is prices are going to go up. It's one of the reasons I think this crash that we're talking about won't happen in single family. The numbers just don't support it. So I am buying as many single family homes bef below the median in my market that I can because I want to get that, you know, the tide raising all ships. I want to have as many ships in the water as I can. Mm -hmm. It's really refreshing hearing uh, this perspective from, um, from you because you're right on social media. It is all multifamily, um, you know, at least the, mm -hmm. the people I, I listen to. 
Um, yeah. and, and so it's, it's refreshing here in, because we're all in single family. Um, it's working for us right now. And it's one of those where you get your feet wet and you kind of do the thing. Yeah. That's, that's family. why I was pressing you when you said you wanted to go to multifamily. You're letting social media influence you make stupid decisions. Go buy 12 more houses, right? Yep. Damn. <laughs> Damn it, Daniel. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Let me get this. Houses are easier to manage. They're boring. And they're going to appreciate more. And you can get 30-year fixed rate money. Oh, I, I want to run away from that product. What are you kidding me? Stop it. <laughs> I think uh, the other thing, and um, you know, it's, it's a deeper discussion for another time, but it's, it's finding uh, the right property manager. Um, oh, when, yes. When, when you are in this, uh, when, when you are a smaller player um, and you have you know, a couple houses, you might not necessarily get that attention where if you were to have a hundred houses. And so that's one thing that we've had a pretty deep discussion on this weekend is finding mm -hmm. that right property manager that works well with you mm -hmm. and that you don't have to handhold. Mm -hmm. um, you don't, you don't want to have to manage your property manager every day and, and <laughs> follow up. And, and it's tough to find that sometimes um, yeah. if you're a smaller player. Uh, yes. I didn't understand the question. Oh, comment. No, yeah, yeah. no, it, it, yeah, it, it's it, property manager is the hardest thing. Again, I, as I shared earlier, uh, uh, I've had property managers since we had one house. I, I will never property manage any of my stuff. Um, and the other thing that should be stated is I fired the first five property managers I had. So I, you know, I can only tell you what's worked for me. I, I kind of have two golden rules now. First and foremost, I want the owner of the property manager, the principal, to be a investor. And I want them to own dozens of things because that will mean the systems and the people that they put in place are, um, it's investor oriented. What I run away from personally is property management firms where the owner is a real estate broker because I've invested in hot and cold markets and their attention deviates. Um, I had one tremendous uh, property management firm that I loved until he became the number one short seller in my market. And guess what? My, my units got less attention because he was printing money during the, cat, the crash. So I will never go to a property manager where the owner is a broker because I've seen what happens in different markets. And do you have all properties with one property manager? I do now. Uh, my, while I was doing our growth phase, we split them 50-50 um, because we, didn't, we wanted the oh shit problem just in case one person went bad. Um, there was a time right near the end where the second team, and again, it was almost equal 50-50, uh, started to disappoint us. And we worked out with the other firm that we wanted a single point. We had weight at that time, right? We were of size. So we said, we want one person, right? We want our dedicated person. We want one call a week. We want this, 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 this. And they gave it to us. And then we, we have everything with one firm now and it's worked out okay. okay. But I wouldn't do that when I was growing, especially in a market far away. I, like I said, we, we split for most of our career right and, and going back to something we touched on earlier i know you were saying you outsource or not outsource but you you delegate some work but you keep bookkeeping you keep certain things mm -hmm. um, so i'm also I'm, I'm a tax accountant my wife is also uh in accounting and one thing that a lot of us in this group have done is we do have a cpa that knows real estate working on our tax returns yeah. so all of us surprisingly enough have also kept bookkeeping in house, um, it kind of it paints a picture of how that month or how that quarter went. Uh, yes. Do you, is there a certain software you use? Are you in Stessa, QuickBooks? How, how do you? No, for us, for us, it always started in Excel. We built all our models when we had one, two, three, five units. We just keep adding worksheets. I wish I had a better answer. I thought about going to QuickBooks, um, but frankly, everything it, we we we've, we've had it dialed in. We do the same repetitive thing, which is kind of what bookkeeping is. Uh, and for us, it's about the story that the building is telling. And now we have 15 to 20 years of ownership in some of these, so we can trend them, right, in charts. So we're not moving that. Okay. Um, do I wish we started somewhere else? You know, if I'm honest, you know, I wish I was in QuickBooks or something like that back in the day. But now it's got so much history there, we're not changing. Right. Okay. Yeah, because I, I thought it was interesting because we all operate pretty similarly. Um, and it, it's... It's cool to see um, we're all friends, but we're also competitors too. We're, we're <laughs> in the same markets going after the same deals. We have that abundance mindset. There's often times where Bo and I will be putting offers in on the same deals. And, and one time he was like, hey, you take this one. And one time I was like, hey, Bo, here's this property. Your turn. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, 
we, there's enough to go around. Um, but what's always another deal. Never. I, yeah. it's funny. We, I have, um, I mean, right. I, I know one person on this video today, right before this call, right. I've talked to Bo a couple of times, but again, you have to act as an abundance mindset. I will purge you from my network. If I get any sense of scarcity and I've had that happen, uh, right during the crash, um, where deals were everywhere. There was a couple of people in our network that were being disingenuous and trying to snake deals. And I'm like, dude, just talk to each other. And they didn't. And I'm like, okay, well, you're out. I will not tolerate scarcity mindset. The life is too short. Uh, see Kobe Bryant for just an example of it. I spend every day focused on one thing and one thing only, and that's being happy. So um, yeah, I'm glad you have an abundance mindset. Yeah. Hey, Michael, um, you know, if you had a magic wand, mm. what would be the, you know, one or two things you might want to just uh, change or update in your current business model? Like anything. I'm curious. Um, I'm happy, man. If I wanted to change, I would. Um, <laughs> um I guess I would, I wish, I wish the one rental at a time kind of mantra was more appreciated out there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm one guy kind of speaking into a vacuum with all these multifamily and syndicators talking about that side of the fence. I believe most people would fundamentally change their financial future if they just set the goal of getting four houses and, and, and be happy with four houses. Um, I think the fact that I've talked to new investors that think if they don't chase 30 unit apartment buildings first, feel like failures is a crime. Uh, I think for all the goodness that Grant Cardone has brought to the, to the uh, investing, I think he is, I think he's hurting most people because he's making owning single family rentals, not sexy. And I think that's a crime. So I wish I could up the volume that one rental at a time is good four rentals is good. Um, that's, that's what I wished I would, you know, self-published author, you know, put out a course to help people that's ridiculously cheap. And, uh, I just wish more people would be confident and focused and, and go get four rentals. That's, that's what I hope for. Is, is there anything we, we can do as investors? I mean, I know again, small group here, but um, we do have access to a very large network and it is Indianapolis specific for now. Uh, so sure. we have access every day at the, the tip of our fingers to speak to 1500 investors that are all looking for single family homes. And so if there's yeah. anything we can do to help get that out, we'd love to. Yeah. I think there'd be two things. One, one is if you guys could get the book one rental at a time and take your selfies with it and then share it with your network saying, guys, I've read this book. This, this guy is us, right? 15 years ago, uh, go buy the book. That would be great. Leave a five-star review on Amazon would be very helpful. Okay. Uh, and then if you have any new investors really trying to figure out what it takes to learn a market, I documented everything I do and I still do today in a course called how to get started one rental at a time. I keep it at one ninety nine on purpose because it's just expensive enough where it's enough that you'll do the work and cheap enough that most people can afford it because it's a month of cash flow. Yep. Uh, and mo most importantly, I, I give you access to a private Facebook group, it, which is where I do my mentoring with my students. Right. Um, so if you have any newbies that are looking to get started and struggling, recommend that course. Those would be the two things. But again, it's hard as one guy kind of speaking into a, a vacuum. That's great. Well, I, I know that a lot of the larger multifamily uh, speakers tend to get a lot of the publicity, but there is a large group of people just like us that are, are really looking up to people like you sharing your story. So we do appreciate you taking your knowledge and, mm -hmm. uh, and sharing it with us, helping us grow, because that, that's what we wanted to, to do this weekend is bring us all together and just have a, a quick crash course on what's working, what's not, how can we all potentially work together in the future, mm -hmm. just uh, really build our businesses and, and actually build our friendships even stronger, which is great. Yep. Go get 12 more houses. All right. <laughs> hey, Michael, thank you so much. We really appreciate your time uh, yep. especially on a Sunday and we look forward to learning more from you in the future. All right, man, do me a favor. Get me this video so I can upload it. All right. Sounds all right. good. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye-bye.